everybody. Oh, I've got a real treat for you today. I'm not presenting, <laughs> but let me tell you who is. We've got Kristen, who is a part of our Bible Prophecy team on Discord, and she presented such an incredible Bible study on the subject of SALT, S-A-L-T. And it's one of the most common used topics in the entire Word of God. And she went through and showed us the blessings of salt and the cursings of salt. And it's really a very scholarly piece of work. And she's delivering it to our Tuesday morning group here on Discord. And it was so wonderful. We all learned so much. And you know, I typically record our Bible studies, but they're just for our intergroup prophecy team here. But this one, we decided to format it so that we could put it on our YouTube channel. And so I just want you to understand that it is a screen recording of her delivering it in our voice chat. And I've listed all the scripture references so that you can follow along or go back through and sit down and go through the lesson on your own later or in segments because it is longer than we typically uh, produce for our channel. But I know that you will be blessed because about every two or three minutes she is dropping an important nugget. So please, as you're watching this, give Kristen some encouragement and let her know you like it and hit the like button because you know it's very challenging for anybody if they're not used to being recorded and they're not used to making such a public delivery it's really hard to put yourself out there so please if you are blessed in any way by her presentation her very thorough work on the topic of salt please encourage her in some way okay enjoy her study I didn't realize how hard it is to put these spiritual matters into words sometimes. And I didn't think it was going to be that hard with salt. And I was just, I was just studying salts for my own, um, just for myself. I mean, because salt has been so huge, any of us who are on the carnivore have probably realized by now how important salt is. Um, I was having terrible cramps and muscle pains and joint pains on this way of eating. And once I added the salt in, um, those all went away. And after my research and research on how salt helps our body and how we need salt to, to function, um, it just had me thinking about all the verses about salt in the Bible, because we know everything that we experience here is symbolic in one way or another to the spirit. So anyways, they've removed, they've treated our water so much. That have re it's removed the mineral our body needs to thrive. So we can't hydrate on water alone. We need salt. Salt is a necessity to our bodies. Anyway, so naturally, I started thinking of Matthew 5.13, where it says, You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has become tasteless, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. So there's a lot here. <laughs> And I'm going to try to unpack it. Um, you know how my studies are, though. When you're trying to just search one word and study one word, it opens up the entire Bible. And it can, because everything's connected. And as we begin connecting all of these Old and New Testament verses, it's just exploding out of the page. So while this began as a study of salt, I've kind of labeled this Bible study salt and fire because they are very cohesive to each other. So, in that verse, Jesus was alluding not to the tang of the salt, but to its value. He was telling his disciples that they had a preserving influence in the world. Back then, salt was highly prized as a preservative of food. So, it was so precious that it was used as money. Roman soldiers were sometimes paid in salt, giving us the word salary, which derived from the Latin word for salt, sal. It was even considered by the Greeks to be divine. Okay. So I'm not trying, there's a whole bunch of studies out there that you can do on salt. Um, a lot of people have studied that topic, but this group knows that there's so much more to unpack from these verses and they're so prophetic and can use, you can usually label a verse to a certain people group, but salt, what I've found is it flows through all of the people groups. 
In many religions, salt is still included on the altar to represent purity. Part of the temple offerings included salt. So I think this study will better help us discern the Old Testament verses in a spiritual sense, because that's what we need to do. They're still very symbolic to us now. So Leviticus 2.13, it says, Every grain offering of yours, moreover, you shall season, which means disperse in fragments with salt, so that the salt of the covenant of your God shall not be lacking from your grain offering. With all of your offerings, you shall offer salt. I might be a little bit behind on the whole salt <laughs> covenant and all of this. And I think there might be a lot of us that are too. So I hope this study is going to help everyone understand these verses better. To definitely help me, and that's why the study is so long. So Exodus 30, 35. With it, you shall make incense, a perfume, the work of a perfumer, salted, pure, and holy. Ezekiel 43, 24 says, You shall present them before the Lord, and the priests shall throw salt on them, and they shall offer them up as a burnt offering to the Lord. 2 Chronicles 13, 5, and I'm getting somewhere with this. I'm giving you all these verses so that we can kind of bring it all together. Ought ye not to know that the Lord God of Israel gave the kingdom over to Israel, to David, over Israel, to David forever, even to him and to his sons by a covenant of salt? Salt in the Middle East had an enduring quality and therefore was also used in ceremonies to seal an agreement. God's covenants are eternal in nature even those in the Old Testament. All, all covenants speak of both a blessing and a curse, just like Matthew 5.13. So Matthew 5.13 is that blessing and that curse, in my opinion. And if you read Leviticus 26, you will see the blessings from that covenant and the curse if you, if you break that covenant. So today, in many Arab cultures, sorry, if two men partake of salt together, they are sworn to protect one another, even if they had previously been enemies. So keep that in mind, too. Salt was a sign of the eternal and irrevocable nature of the covenant. The covenant of salt in Numbers 18.19 speaks, speaks of the sons of Aaron and their relationship to God. As priests, the sons of Aaron were not going to receive any inheritance in the land because God was their eternal inheritance. So here, the covenant of salt signifies the perpetual nature of their relationship with the Lord, which is God would provide for them. Numbers 18, 19. All the offerings of the holy gifts with the son, which the sons of Israel offer to the Lord, I have given to you and to your sons and to your daughters with you as a perpetual allotment. It is an everlasting covenant of, the salt, of salt before the Lord to you and to your descendants with you. So, salt came from the Hebrew word malah, which came from another Hebrew word, malah. <laughs> um, and that word is used once in Ezra. So, salt in um, H4417 really doesn't give you much of an explanation, but the further you search, there's another word for salt. It's to eat salt. It means maintenance. It also means slaves through whom their owners provide victuals and provisions. So that word is used once. It's in Ezra 4.14. It says, now because we are in the service, and that's the word used there, which means salt. So salt is service, service of the palace. And it is not fitting for us to see the king's dishonor. Therefore, we have sent and informed the king, which means we have eaten the salt. And there's some of the, some translations actually say, we have eaten the salt of the palace. It means they've assumed obligations of loyalty. So our salt is the salt of the palace. It means they took an oath. Many other translations. Oh, I'm sorry. I already said that. I think it's best if I just go off of my script here because I've already had all my thoughts and I've written them out so that I wouldn't uh, jump all over the place. Um, so this covenant and the meaning of salt had me thinking of a few verses. Psalm 37 is the security of those who trust in the Lord and the insecurity of the wicked. And if you contrast that to Leviticus 26, the first part is the blessings of the covenant. And then the last is the curse if you break the covenant, right? So this is the security and the insecurity. 
Psalm 37, 28. For the Lord loves justice, and he does not forsake his godly ones. They are preserved forever, but the descendants of the wicked will be cut off. Psalm 37, 25. I have been young, and now I am old, yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken or his descendants begging for bread. Right? That means, to me, they were in a covenant. They were in that salt covenant where they would be provided for if we keep trusting in the Lord. So the primary use for salt was as a preservative. When meat is butchered, it will soon begin to decay or rot because of the surface bacteria. Salt kills the bacteria and prevents a rapid putrefaction. It was also known for purification, and that's why many Bible scholars think that's why they sprinkled the salt on the sacrifices. It was to preserve and to purify the sacrifices that were made. I don't know if that's true. That's just speculation. I thought it was interesting. Um, it makes a lot of sense. I think it's a God used salt uh, very symbolically as a preservative. So that's just had me thinking about a lot of the verses in the Bible that talk about preserving something. So the Greek word for salt is alas. It's salt with which food is seasoned and sacrifices are sprinkled. It means wisdom and grace exhibited in speech and figuratively meaning prudence uh, and those kinds of saline matter used to fertilize arable land. So arable land is any land capable of being plowed and used to grow crops. And this is where we kind of take a turn in the study from the salt and move into the harvest model. Uh, I didn't mean to do that. It seems that every time I do a Bible study, um, the harvest model always comes in because it's all over the Bible. And I think it's really important for us to know. I know we already know a lot in this group about the harvest model. So I'm hoping this might fill in some blanks. <clears throat> I have some questions too, so do or anyone else, if if I'm off, <laughs> just unmute and, and pop in and, and get me straight. But this is what I, the way I'm seeing things. So Matthew 13, 37, 38. And he said, the one who sows the good seed is the son of man, and the field is the world. And as for the good seed, these are the sons of the kingdom, and the tares are the sons of the evil one. Research has found that sea salt used as fertilizer is very useful. The benefits include increased plant growth, more yields, plants are more resilient, are, sorry, resistant to pests and diseases, fruit or crop yields taste better, fruit or plants do not easily rot, and higher levels of sugar and vitamins. Plants need salinity to survive. Salinity requires salt, which means the presence of salt in the soil as a nutrient is necessary. On another note, salt can also kill weeds and tares. It's funny how something so crucial like salt can also be quite deadly. There are more scriptural references to salt being used in and for judgment and destruction than to any of the other purposes. Salt in the ancient times was used to express judgment upon evil. 1 Corinthians 6, 2-3 tells us the church will judge the earth and the angels. It says, do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if you are to judge the world, are you not competent to ju judge trivial cases? Do you not know that you will judge angels? How much more the things of this life? <clears throat> when Lot's wife turned back to look at the city of Sodom, she turned into a pillar of salt. A story Jesus refers to when describing the day of his coming. Moses warns the Israelites that if they break God's covenant, which was the salt covenant, their land will be burned out with brimstone and salt, nothing sown and nothing growing, where no plant can sprout. And so again, that's in Leviticus 26. That is, that's the curse of the, <laughs> of the covenant. So Deuteronomy 29, 23 says, all its land is brimstone and salt, burned debris, unsown and unproductive, and no grass grows on it. Like the overthrow of Sodom and Gomorrah, Adma and Zeboim, which the Lord overthrew in his anger and in his wrath. When Gideon's son Abimelech tries to set himself up as king of Israel, the men of Shechem rebel against him, and he responds by destroying the city and sowing it with salt. So sowing with salt was an ancient ritual of spreading salt on the sites of cities destroyed by conquerors. 
It was also a sign of placing a curse on the land to be unproductive. I started to view this as how the church is sent to make the beast system's agenda unsuccessful, but are failing to do so as of yet. The church needs to be spreading and sowing with salt on this earth to thwart the plans of the enemy. But are they? As I was praying yesterday, I just prayed that the Holy Spirit would fill in all the blanks because as I'm trying to consolidate the study, it kept growing and growing and he kept showing me more and showing me more and how everything was connected to salt. And then today, <laughs> and then today I wake up thinking everything's done with the study and I open my Facebook memories because that's one of the first things I do because I love to see how what he's told me on each day and what he's shown me throughout the years. And today he had a little bit more to show me for this study because I'm thinking if the church is supposed to be the salt and it's meant for, I mean, it's meant for so many things, good and bad, but if judgment is part of it, are they doing what they need to be doing? How are they stopping the evil in this world? So Psalm 106, 34, uh, I think it's 34. I put through 37, but I don't think I added the whole thing. So it says, they did not destroy the peoples as the Lord commanded them. However, they mingled with the nations and learned their practice practices and served their idols, which became a snare to them. They even sacrificed their sons and their daughters to demons. Judges 2.12. And they abandoned the Lord, the God of their father, fathers, who had brought them out of the land of Egypt. And they followed other gods. From, from the gods of the peoples who were around them and bowed down to them. So they provoked the Lord to anger. I know this is speaking um, of Israel, and I know this is speaking of the old covenant and everything, but I, I can't help but think that this has been, this has cycled back around, and now this is how the church is acting. We're not, they're, they're not so much denying the traditions of men and and the practices of evil in this world that have been made so that have just been normalized, but instead they're mingling with them and defending them. And I can't imagine that doesn't provoke the Lord to anger because it, it makes me angry sometimes. Anyways, Psalm 107, 34, God speaks of turning a fruitful land into a salty waste because of the evil of its inhabitants. Jesus himself, in one of the fiercest judgment paragraphs in the Gospels, says simply that everyone will be salted with fire. That's Mark 9.49. And Mark is speaking to the Left Behind Church. Another interesting thing is that the remaining part of this verse has been removed from all online translations other than the KJV. So while all the other translations say, for everyone shall be salted with fire, period, the KJV says, everyone shall be salted with fire, and every sacrifice shall be salted with salt. I don't know exactly why they removed that part. I mean, I have some guesses. Salted with fire refers us to temp temple sacrificial system, with its sacrifices seasoned with salt, then burned on the altar to explain our lives as a living sacrifice the fire on the altar of burnt offers, offerings was, divine, was a divine gift, having been lit originally by God himself. God charged the priests with keeping his fire lit. Leviticus 6.13 fire, fire shall be kept burning continually on the altar. It is not to go out. And he made it clear that fire from any other source was unacceptable. I'm viewing this as fire from false doctrine, traditions of men. Fill in the blanks there. Leviticus 10.1. Aaron's son, Nadab and Abihu, put coals of fire in their incense burners and sprinkled incense over them. In this way, they disobeyed the Lord by burning before him the wrong kind of fire, different than he had commanded. Right? If we're to be sprinkling salt and they sprinkled incense, that's the strange fire that he didn't like. In the New Testament, the altar can serve as a picture of our commitment to the Lord. As believers in Jesus Christ, we are called upon to offer our bodies as a living sacrifice, engulfed by the divine gift, the inextinguishable fire of the Holy Spirit. 
At the very beginning of the New Testament, the Holy Spirit is associated with fire. John the Baptist predicts that Jesus will be the one to baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. So take note that true salt is inflammable. Salt that has been mixed with other things is not. Unless the purity of Jesus is evident in our daily lives, it will be like salt without flavor or a strange fire. The Holy Spirit has control of the flame and temperature as they are only being sprinkled with the salt. A fire hotter and salt can also smother a flame. And as soon as I read this, this verse came to mind. 1 Thessalonians 5.19, it says, do not quench the spirit. Okay, so now I'm going to kind of go in and talk about a little bit of the harvest model. So the church is the main harvest who are still maturing in the field. Um, This is a reference Sue always makes is that they need more sun exposure. (laughs) So they need more exposure to the sun before fully maturing and being ready to harvest. Farmers know the main harvest is ready when 90% of the field turns gold. So I have to ask, does it feel like 90% of Christians are mature and ready for their blessed hope? I don't think so. A lot of people think that everyone's going, and I don't see 90% of Christians standing up for God and, and the truth, or worshiping in spirit and in truth. So back to do not quench the spirit. Quench is G4570. I'm not even going to try to pronounce that word. It means to extinguish, quench, a fire or things on fire, to be quenched, to go out. A metaphor to quench, to suppress, stifle, or of divine influence. Ephesians 6.16. In addition to all, taking up the shield of faith with which you will be able to extinguish all flaming arrows of the evil one. So again, fire is like salt where it can can be a really good thing or it can be a really bad thing. You want to make sure you're falling on the right side of that fire. The Bible describes God as a consuming fire. Okay, as you can see now, I'm sure my face is hot. I'm not nervous. I'm sweating like I am, but I'm not. Um, I get hot when I speak the word. When I'm evangelizing to someone, I get this rush of heat. I start sweating. My face gets red. You know, I start shaking. <laughs> it's, it's like my vessel physically cannot handle the flame and the fire and the passion that's roaring through me. As I'm speaking to someone, because I know that's when the Holy Spirit is there speaking through me. I am shoved to the back and the Holy Spirit's doing his work and it's hot. (laughs) Anyways, I'm sweating now. I'm still, I'm still really hot. (laughs) It's, it just reminds me of Jeremiah when he says, Your word was in my heart like a burning fire, shut up in my bones, and I was weary of holding it back, and I couldn't. I feel that. I feel that so much. (laughs) This, it consumes you, especially when, when you're searching for ways to reach people and to speak to people and to sow the word of God. It's just, it's so hot. (laughs) I love it. I love it, but it's also pretty exhausting, too, to our physical bodies. There's no other way to explain that rush of heat. We are being seasoned with fire as we sow the word of God. We are in the field right now, unwavering, not turning back. We need to be sowing the word of God so we have something to reap. If the church are our children, that means we need to be fertilizing the field now with salt so they flourish into a mature crop ready for harvest, their mid-trib rapture. Speaking life now and getting practice for our glorified ministry when we will come back to serve them and help and work the harvest. Matthew twenty four thirteen, But the gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all the nations, and then the end will come. Okay, this is what we should all be doing. Proverbs 13, 2 through 3 says, A man shall eat well by the fruit of his mouth, but the soul of the unfaithful feeds on violence. He who guards his mouth preserves his life. 
but he who opens wide his lips shall have destruction. So I believe that verse is a clue to Colossians 4, 6, when it says, let your speech always be with grace as though seasoned with salt so that you will know how you should respond to each person. The verses above uh, verse 6 in that passage give you more insight. It says, praying at the same time for us as well. And this is what I asked Ange and a few other people for yesterday, that God will open up to us a door for the word so that we may speak forth the mystery of Christ for which I have also been imprisoned, that I may make it clear in the way I ought to speak. Conduct yourselves with wisdom towards outsiders, making the most of the opportunity. So, I know we've talked about this before at the events I go to. I love talking to unbelievers or to new agers. I think they accept the things of the spirit better than the church does sometimes. But I'm always praying that I don't get annoyed or angry for their nonsense, you know, and that I can speak ways that they can understand. That's something we all need to be doing. I was asking for him to to give me the salt to season with the whole time, but we all have it. So our words and the way we communicate them are important. As believers, our words should reflect to others the truth of the gospel. They should reveal how this gospel has transformed our lives and that transformation should be evident to all. Our words should impact our conversations for the better as we bring a different flavor to the interaction to our interactions build others up and share as well as defend the gospel. Luke 6:45 tells us the words we speak reflect what is in our hearts for the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. So, again going back to the salt can be used for good or for judgment. Salt can be good, but it can also be really abrasive. So we have to be carefully aware of how we use that salt. But also I think there's some times where we need to be a little abrasive, especially when people are against the gospel or blasphemous. Anyways, Luke 8, 11 says, Now the parable is this, the seed is the word of God. Matthew 13, 24. He put another parable before them saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. So, that is how we speak. We are either sowing good or sowing bad, right? So an example, an example of this, we can all, I know we've all been changed and we're all better about how we act and how we talk. Um, at least we're more aware of it and we are working on it. That's what the bride is doing now, right? She is already working on these things. We just moved into a new place and everything is great. Everything was going great. And the night before we moved in, my husband met one of our neighbors. <laughs> and it wasn't the most pleasant conversation <laughs> that he's ever been a part of. He refrained from being <laughs> rude, which is a really big step for him. Um, but this woman just doesn't know how to love thy neighbor. <laughs> Anyways. Um, I won't get into all the details of that, but I, I got so upset. I was so stressed out that night, just trying to get everything, um, ready to move that I was going through my head of all of the sassy things I'm going to say to her. If she even talks to me that way and, you know, and then I'm like, forgive me. <laughs> That's my old self, right? I wouldn't accomplish anything if I were to give her any kind of sass, even though she was well deserving of the abrasive effect of salt but it wasn't going to be beneficial. So anyways, God just kind of helped me work through that. And I ended up sending her a really nice message. Um, right. There's that verse. It's probably in Proverbs that a brother offended is hard to win over. And I, I want to win my neighbors over and I'm not going to be that if I act the way this woman did. Anyway, so there's just an example. We always need to be making sure that we are sowing good seed and not bad. <laughs> And it's a work in progress for all of us, I know. Galatians 6, 7 through 8 says, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that will he also reap. 
For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption, but the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. I want that eternal life. I don't want silly conversations and my fleshly mind and sass that comes way too easily to me get in the way of that. Anyways, we're to be sowing the word of God, right? If we're not sowing the word, we are sowing to our flesh, which is going to produce death. It means we are not in service to the kingdom, but we're in service to ourselves. We would be producing death and not life. And we do not want to be outside the salt covenant of provisions and protections. We can't do this on our own, and I don't know who would want to. We need his help to be constantly seasoned with salt and to be seasoning others with salt. Proverbs eleven eighteen, The wicked earns deceptive wages, but one who sows righteousness gets a sure reward. We know how much, we know how important that word is, reward. And we know what that means too. 2 Corinthians 9, 6 says, The point is this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So don't lose your reward. Salt is always referenced as enduring, right? Whether the bride is enduring now or the church endures, endures through the first half of tribulation or when the gleanings are enduring until the end. Salt is always to be enduring and preserving. James 1, 2 through 4. I'm reading this from the Amplified Bible because I think the way it said it was just beautiful and more in depth. It says, consider it nothing but joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you fall into various trials. Be assured that the testing of your faith through experience produces endurance, leading to spiritual maturity and inner peace. And let endurance have its perfect result and do a thorough work so that you may be perfect and completely developed in your faith, lacking in nothing. Right? That's a mature believer. That's someone who's ready to be harvested. That is a crop ready to go. And I love how this verse here, it uses the word produce, produce, which is where you get the word produce from, is from the word produce, <laughs> right next to the word endurance, because of the fact that salt is always used as an enduring substance. Anyways, I just thought that was really cute. So produce means to go. To act with effect, it means to maintain, right? Like the salt covenant means maintenance, daily maintenance. It means to commit, prepare, perform, accomplish, advance. And now you all probably know where I'm going with this because one of my favorite Bible studies is about the rib. Isaiah 61.10 uses a word that means the exact same thing as what produce means. Isaiah 61.10. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he hath clothed me with the garments of salvation. He hath covered me with the robe of righteousness as a bridegroom decketh himself with ornaments and as a bride adorneth herself with her jewels. That word adorneth means to go, to act, to advance. Anyways, we're supposed to be producing, right? Adorning ourselves with the produce from the sowing. Anyways, I just, I love how, I love how his word just goes full circle into everything. This world, this word also means to serve. It means warrior, workman, labor, work about. This is for the bride, the church, and the remnant. The church is currently at ease, in my opinion. But the bride is advancing. She's preparing. She's acting. She's waiting desperately to go. First Corinthians 619 says, or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God and that you are not your own? I think we would all have a lot less issues if we remembered that verse. Second Corinthians 515. He died for all. So that they who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. Ephesians 2, 18 through 21. For through whom him, sorry, 
For through him, we both have our access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole building being fitted together is growing into a holy temple in the Lord. So believers are now the temple of God, right? Our burnt offerings are our, la- our living sacrifice, holy and blameless for the one who died for us. We are giving up our lives this side of the pre-tribulation rapture, and we are already being preserved with fire from the Holy Spirit in us. Remember, fire can either be good or bad, just like salt, a blessing or a curse. Deuteronomy eleven twenty six through 28 says, See, I am placing before you today a blessing and a curse. The blessing, if you listen to the commandments of the Lord your God, which I am commanding you today, and the curse, if you do not listen to the commandments of the Lord your God, but turn aside from the way which I am commanding you today by following other gods which you have not known. 1 Corinthians three thirteen through 15. Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort. That came from the Greek word meaning quality. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. Right? That's the mid-trip rapture of the church, the main harvest, in my opinion. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. I'm seeing this too as that's the, uh, maybe a church member that, that, that wasn't ready, right? They are now left behind that second time and become a gleaning. To be left to the stranger, the poor, the alien, right? The ones outside of the faith. They are, would now be the preserving remnant of the word of God. But it's going to be painful. Those who enter this fire will be salted with fire, which is to say they will be preserved so that the agonizing fire will not annihilate them and they will not be consumed by the flames. I also kind of connected that to, and I could be wrong here about the timing of this, but because Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they didn't, they didn't worship the golden image. They didn't, they didn't bow down to the beast system that was persecuting, right? To try to save their lives. They were thrown into the fire, but they weren't harmed. Anyway, so I'm viewing that as the remnant that will be severely persecuted the last half of the tribulation period. Um, Before I move on, does anyone want to say anything? Or Sue, do you want to correct me on anything or add something? I just am loving this. This is so beautiful, Kristen. I, it's like, I'm thinking, oh, I hope the microphone is recording this. I hope, you know, because I want to hear it again. And yes, oh, I, good. Okay. yes, you're absolutely right in the timing of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, because we realize Daniel is not present in that right. record. Yeah. He, he's gone. He's gone. That's exactly that. Listen, I have a whole notebook full now of things I have to study just from this study. I was like, Sue's going to be so mad. I'm going to be jumping all over the place trying to prove all of this, you know, in the word. But I have a lot just I have a lot of things I connected that I had to leave out because I'm trying to focus on just this tough. <laughs> OK, and well, great. Thanks for the. You will get to those other topics, things you had to leave out. Then you can bring those up. We'll have you do more videos because this is why, you know, I want to share this platform so that all of you get a chance to create with the help of the Holy Spirit, a study because you're the one that grows the most. And then we get this overflow for days and weeks beyond your delivery of your presentation because you've got so many things you didn't get to share. So I'm going to be quiet now so you can, anybody else can talk or you can go ahead and start sharing again. Okay. Any, does anyone else want to say anything before I continue on? Okay. So 
So this is something interesting I found. And I know we've talked a little about flax. This is this is so huge the way I'm seeing it that I'm not going to talk about it too much here, but it's definitely some it's definitely something we need to think about. So Matthew 12:20 A battered which means broken hearted reed which means rod he will not break off which means break to pieces and a smoldering wick which means flax he will not put out until he leads justice to victory okay this is a scene where they're walking in the harvest of grain it reminded me of the verse second timothy where it says fan the flame that is inside of you which is a gift the gift of god fan that flame right the air the flame needs that air so fan it back into a full roaring <laughs> fire anyways i know i jumped all over there a battered reed we know that the reed or the rod of iron is the church and they're the light right which is a wick the flax anyways i'm not gonna go that you i planted some seeds there i'm sure you can see where i'm going but i'll skip that for now so a battered reed he will not break and a smoldering wick he will not put out until he leads justice to victory. Matthew was quoting a prophecy from Isaiah 42, 1 through 4, when he said this. Isaiah 4, 42, 3. A bruised reed shall he not break and the smoking flax, which is a wick for a lamp, shall he not quench. He shall bring forth judgment unto truth. A reed that is bruised may be damaged, but it's not irreparable. A smoldering wick may be about to lose its fire altogether, but it can still be reignited. To the world, a bruised reed is worthless, as a worthless thing. It has no power, no stability, no purpose. It's good for nothing but to be cut down and discarded. So in the world, there are many bruised people, individuals who have been wounded emotionally, spiritually, physically. I know a lot of us have a lot of a lot of physical problems, but that doesn't mean that you can't, he can't use you. And they may seem feeble and to the most of the world, they might be dispensable, but not to God. The prophecy that Jesus fulfilled is that the bruised reed, he would not break. It's a prophecy that speaks of Christ's tender, compassionate care for the weak and downtrodden church. And we know he chose the weak things to shame the strong. So he is going to, as long as there's still something he can use, he's going to use it. Any, anyone who still has a little bit of a fire lit for the Holy Spirit or through the Holy Spirit, he's going to use them, right? And hopefully that fire will grow stronger and stronger to make them more useful to the kingdom. The word battered in that verse means to break, to break into pieces, bruised, shiver, to tread down to put Satan underfoot as a conqueror, trample on him, to break down, crush, or to tear one's body and shatter one's strength. It also means brokenhearted. So in my opinion, this verse is talking about the church. It's the point in scripture where the reed had already been beaten down. Okay, that is harvest talk there. Um, that's how you would, when you beat the grain in the, um, when you beat the grain to get the chaff off, it's the outer covering, it's sin, it's traditions, it's it's false doctrines. Okay, it's that's what I'm viewing the chaff as. That's the the thing that, that doesn't belong, right? Once that's been removed. Sorry, let me get back here. They had already been beaten down or persecuted. Now they'll pick up the baton. And Sue, you always say, you know, after a rapture, the next group picks up the baton. <laughs> And I always love that that imagery, but the reed and rod, it literally means baton. So I don't know if you knew that and that's why you say it, or if you were just spot on the whole time. I did not noticing. know I did not know that. I love this <laughs> insight. That's beautiful. Thank you. <laughs> I'm so I love that you didn't know that because I'm like, oh they, that's why she always says that. That makes a lot of sense. Anyways, so they all then pick up the baton right? The, they're the rod and do the threshing, which is, here's the thing is that everyone, the church thinks that we're all going to be raptured and then have that seven year honeymoon in heaven. You know, we obviously know that's not true. He's using all these groups all throughout 
Daniel's 70th week. And uh, there's that verse where he sends some out, some out to mark the ones that are mourning. I think I have that verse in here somewhere. Um, and then he sends another group out to destroy everyone else who wasn't wasn't mourning and crying out for the abominations happening in the world. So I think the church will be a part of that, that threshing, the beating. So the threshing floor, that's when they're beating the grain or, or trampling them underfoot, which is something we need to keep in mind too for this study. Anyways, I think that's what they're going to do. They're going to also pick up that baton and do the threshing, do the beating. That's why um, in the gospels, it says, don't muzzle the ox while he's threshing. Meaning, they get to eat of the harvest too, right? They are they are being provided for through through this time. Anyways, I don't think I explained that very well. This is the harvest model and the threshing floor is like that's a whole study in itself, and I'm just skimming the top of it just to get the study, um, just to give you the the foundation for the rest of the study. But I will do I will do another study on the threshing floor, and it will really open up a lot to you. I think. Anyways, in my opinion, that was saying they were prepared to go in the mid-trip rapture, the main harvest, and will now be God's rod of iron to rule with. Luke 12, 47. And that servant, which knew his Lord's will and prepared not himself, neither did according to his will, shall be beaten with many stripes. This to me is a sign of a church member losing their reward. And now they will have to painfully remove the chaff while being threshed or beaten. I could be off here, um, but that's just how I'm viewing it here. Um, I know chaff is the weeds, the tares, the the wicked, but that's the stuff we all have to remove, right? That's our outer covering, you know, and then you want to get to the good stuff on the inside. Anyways, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. This is Revelation 2.27. As the vessels of the potter are broken... To pieces as I have also received authority from my father again so I'm seeing in the verses before we're seeing that the church won't be broken to pieces but there is a group that will be broken to pieces and since he's correlating the r ruling with a rod of iron as the vessels of the potter are broken to pieces I see that as the church being the ones who are breaking those other vessels to pieces this could be a, a good thing or a bad thing too right Sometimes he has to break us down so that he can build us back up again the way he sees fit and not the way we've built ourselves up. Revelation 11, 1. And there was given to me a reed like unto a rod. And the angel stood saying, rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and them that worship therein. Okay. So if the rod is already there. They're the ones measuring the temple of God and the altar and them that are worshiping in it. And then right after that, it says, but the court, which is without the temple, leave out and measure it not. For it is given unto the Gentiles and the holy city shall be tread underfoot 40 and two months, which is the remnant. So remember, this is when, remember this when we get back to Matthew 5, 13. The church member that becomes tasteless now becomes a gleaming to be left behind and persecuted by the beast system, right? Tread underfoot, thrown out if they're, if they're not salty. So angels and the, are the reapers, right? Which is also the church, which will be crushing the wheat or breaking the vessels in the final harvest. One of the ways to harvest wheat is to beat it on the ground until the chaff falls off. Here's how the harvest works. So the the threshing floor, final harvest, the wheat are the gleanings, right? They were removed and the chaff fell to the ground and was collected to make new pottery and new vessels. Pottery was then fired at high temperatures to make the pots hard and durable. So again, that's kind of going to go with the threshing floor and the chaff and all in that kind of study. But you're seeing two different vessels here okay so we see that in romans 9 19 through 21 will you say to me then why does he still find fault for who has resisted his will on the contrary who are you you foolish person who answers back to god 
The thing molded will not say to the molder, why did you make me like this, will it? Or does the potter not have a right over the clay to make from the same lump one object for honorable use and another for dishonorable use? What if God, although willing to dem demonstrate his wrath and to make his power known, endured with great patience objects of wrath prepared for destruction? And he did so to make known the riches of his glory upon objects of mercy, which he prepared beforehand for glory, namely us whom he has also called, not only from among the Jews, but also from among the Gentiles. Okay, the Bible says that God created all things for his pleasure. To receive pleasure from his creatures, each creature has to be uh, fulfilling its assignment and purpose. God isn't a purpose purposeless being or potter who creates unuseful things. He has a plan for all of his vessels, either for glory and mercy or for wrath. Jesus said he came into the world for this, to destroy the works of the devil. We are either with him or we are against him. So I feel I'm seeing this as like we all have, everyone has this great opportunity, right, to, to be a part of his goodwill. But he also has another part for his, for the other vessels. And we can choose to be vessels of righteousness or used and destroyed as vessels of wrath, right? Thrown into the fire as the chaff. Matthew 3, 11 through 12. I baptize you with water for repentance, but after me comes one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor, gathering his wheat, the remnant, into the barn and burning up the chaff, which are weeds, their tares, with unquenchable fire. <clears throat> so remember again, Psalm 37, 28, it says, for the Lord loves justice and he does not forsake his godly ones. They are preserved forever, but the descendants of the wicked will be cut off. Preserve came from the Hebrew word yasa. I mean, salvation, to save, to be saved, to be delivered, to be liberated, to be victorious. Another thing I found that was really interesting is that Salt is the origin of the word salvation, which is, when you realize that, it opens up a lot to, to correlate preservation, salvation, and salt. I mean, obviously those things, salt preserves, that's its main quality. That was its main purpose and use in ancient times, right? It, it saved food, it saved your provisions. So good. So Isaiah 49, 6 through 8 says salvation reaches to the end of the earth, right? Just like the word is supposed to be preached to the end of the earth to preserve the earth and everyone in it. He says, is it too small a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved ones? Which are the watch is also that word also means watchers of the vineyard of Israel. I will also make you a light. A luminary. There you have the preservation, the salt, and the light of the nations, so that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. Thus says the Lord, in an acceptable time I have heard you, and in the day of salvation I have helped you. I will preserve you, and I will give you as a covenant to the people to restore the earth, to cause them to inherit the desolate heritages. That's the salt covenant. When you read, when you read Leviticus 26, it's, it goes from all the blessings from the covenant and then everything that's going to happen if you disobey or if you break that covenant with God. And then at the end it says, but if you come back, I'll have mercy on you. I'll have compassion. Some people really, you know, when we were going through the last several years with all the, the nonsense going on around the world, I was kind of grateful. And I know that might be weird to a lot of people. I know not this group. I was kind of praying for harder times because people are so complacent. They're stagnant. They're getting everything they want. Nothing's really being affected. They don't really have any reason to search for God or truth or anything outside of this existence because they're so self-absorbed in right now in this materialistic way, you know? 
So I can see why God would be like, fine, this is what's going to happen. And I'm, a lot of people are saved out of those hard times. A lot of people are saved out of the fire because they finally cry out to him. And the Bible talks about that, you know, all over. Anyways, that's just a side note. So here's a warning, and this is to everyone. Just like the bride could turn back, I, I can't imagine, I can't imagine how you would taste of something so good and then turn your back, but we see that it's happened all over the Bible. So this is a strong warning to the bride, to the church, to the remnant. Salt is good. This is Mark 9, 50. Salt is good. But if the salt becomes tasteless or unsalty, with what will you make it salty again? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. God scatters salty Christians into the world as a way of judging evil, destroying wickedness, and preventing lust or greed or murder or injustice from taking root. These are the weeds that salt can destroy. The very existence of the church, preaching and living out the gospel, pro proclaims judgment against the enemies of God and serves as what Paul calls a clear sign to them of their destruction. This may be why Jesus calls the church the salt of the earth. Immediately after describing the persecution they will face by following him. Frequently, of course, the church has failed to live this way and has been an accelerator of worldly evil, not a break. But Jesus knew that would happen and he has a way out for all of it. That's why almost all of his words of judgment are directed to the people of God rather than to the unbelieving world. Back to Matthew 5.13. You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt has become tasteless, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. Become tasteless is the Greek word moreno. It means to be foolish, to act foolishly, to make foolish, to prove a person or a thing foolish, to make flat and tasteless of salt that has lost its strength or flavor. So we know that word foolish. We keep seeing it and we know what it means. Although natural salts can never spoil and can last indefinitely, table salts with additives can lose their flavor and texture over time. The primary reason for this is because often salt isn't totally pure. Salt might lose its flavor under certain conditions when it contains chemical impurities. Other possible reasons might be Salt might have absorbed humidity and eventually evaporated and left behind a substance that looks like salt, but it does not taste like salt. It has the appearance of salt, but isn't salt. Okay, obviously that reminded me of 2 Timothy 3.5. Having the appearance of godliness, but denying its power. Avoid such people. Here is another warning from Luke 14.34. It says, therefore, salt is good. But even if salt has become tasteless, with what will it be seasoned? Okay, it's the same word all over here. Seasoned means to prepare. Arrange with respect to food, to season, make savory. It came from the Greek word arrow, which means to raise up, elevate, lift up, to raise from the ground, take up stones, to raise upwards, elevate, lift up the hand, to take off or away what is attached to anything, to remove, to draw up, a fish, be exalted, or it means atone for sin, okay? So if we lose our saltiness and we are filled with all the things of the world, that's holding us back. We're not going to be lifted up. How then can we be lifted up if we are entangled by all of these, all of the things in the world? Traditions of men seem to be the most had the heaviest things <laughs> that are attached to people. Anyways, I just thought that was really cool. How are you going to be, how are you going to be raptured? <laughs> how are you going to be elevated, lifted up high if, if you want to stay down so low? Luke 1435. It is useless either for the soil or for the manure pile. It is thrown out. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Hebrews 6, 4, for in the case of those who have once been enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and have been made partakers of the Holy Spirit 
and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come. Verse 6, 6. And then have fallen away. It is impossible to renew them again to repentance since they again crucify to themselves the son of God and put him to open shame. I I'm starting to see the word fallen away a little deeper now. Um, when you are harvesting grain, um, you would trample underfoot and then the winnowing fork, they would throw up in the air and the chaff would fall to the ground. Anyways, that's a, they'd be throwing the grain up. And if they were chaff, it just fell to the ground, right? I, I hope you, I hope I explained that right. The way I'm seeing it as symbolically as a, as a rapture, right? If, if they're heavy, the chaff is heavy, it falls to the ground. Anyways, Second Peter 2.20. For, for if after they have escaped the defilements of the world by the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, They are grain, or sorry, they are again entangled in them and are overcome. The last state has become worse than the first state, right? They're entangled. That's, to me, again, that's the chaff. That's the entanglement. The weeds just drowning you out. 2 Peter 2.21, for it would be better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it, to turn away from the holy commandment handed to them. Oh, Can you imagine missing a rapture? Because you were too caught up in the things of this world that we know are destined to perish. Romans 1.22 Professing to be wise, they became fools. The word become tasteless, G3471, came from the same word, foolish. From G3474, Moros. Hey, is that where we get the word moron? Hmm, I bet you it is. Moros. It means foolish, impious, irreverent, godless. Right? And we know the ones who miss a rapture are called foolish. I'm going to pause right there. Any questions or comments, additions, corrections, please feel free. I'm loving this so much. I cannot even communicate it properly. Great delivery. Loving it. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. All right. Second John 1 8 says, look to yourselves that we lose, sorry, that we do not lose the things which we have wrought, but that we receive a full reward. So that word lose is perish, destruction. Because it means perish, what can we do? To, what can we do to preserve? It's it's salt. So I'm seeing all of these verses just cohesively connecting with salt. That is our preserving factor. It's the word of God. It's that covenant with God, right? Don't lose what you've been given to make sure you receive a full reward. So that came. Um, let me see. Sorry, the word become tasteless also is the base of that word is G3466, mysterion. It means dull or stupid, as if shut up, heedless, morally block-headed. It means absurd, foolish, foolishness. It means to shut the mouth. This is a strong warning to the church. And I think to the bride too, to not keep our mouths shut or hide the light, right? What do we, the church is the light. Don't put it under the bed. Um, Which is, he's also referencing when he's talking about salt, the salt and light. That's a whole study on its own. Anyways, because it is a whole study on its own, but I'm going to jump to Matthew 5, 16, just real quick. In the same way, let your light shine before men, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father, which is in heaven. Okay? That's a sign that we should look different, sound different, be different. That's that's the salt. Salt was widely and variably used as a symbol and a sacred sign in ancient Israel. Numbers 18, 19, and 2 Chronicles 13, 5 illustrate salt as a covenant of friendship. In cultures throughout the region, the eating of salt is a sign of friendship, okay? Also, keep in mind the church 
are the friends of the bridegroom. John 3, 29. He that hath the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom, which standeth and heareth him, rejoiceth greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This my joy, therefore, is fulfilled. Okay, so the ones that are the friends, they're hearing him. They're hearing the voice of the bridegroom. And hopefully right now, the voice of the bride. Matthew seven twenty six. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them, that word act, again, remember, makes it means make ready or prepare, will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. Okay, if we're not preparing now, we're, we're going to miss something. We, we're going to be considered foolish, and we do not want to back. Okay, so again, back to the last part of Matthew 5.13, it says, You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has become foolish, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. Okay. I didn't realize how many verses, especially those relating to salt and preservation, are actually using harvest model language. And they are, in fact, a very strong warning to the church. So you're going to have to view this both, both physically and spiritually and discern it that way. Thrown out and trampled underfoot. I immediately always, every time I see that, would always think the grapes, right? The crushing of the... Um, the trampling underfoot, you would crush the grapes with your feet, the wine press. And I'm trying to connect all these things because it's like, how does it skip from here just to be thrown out all the way at the end of the age in the, in the wine press, which is the whole other study on its own, but it's the wicked grapes that are being crushed in the wine press. And I know there's a lot of things that I need to know about the grapes too. So that's why I'm going to study that again. But the trampled underfoot had me for a minute because I'm like, they're not grapes. Anyways, I discovered, I, un I uncovered what it means. So trampled underfoot uh, is from the Greek word, the Greek word, a Greek word. It means to tread down, trample underfoot, to trample on, metaphor, to treat with rudeness and insult, to, to spurn, treat with insulting neglect. It came from the Greek word pateo, to tread, to trample, crush with the feet, to advance by setting foot upon, tread upon, to encounter successfully the greatest perils from the, that's, I'm sorry, that's probably a whole lot that I don't need to say. Um, thwarting the, so it's of Satan, um, would feign to thwart the preaching of the gospel, to tread underfoot, trample on, an example to treat with insult and contempt, to desecrate the holy city by devastation and outrage. So I'm going to deviate a, a little bit again. <laughs> Bear with me from Matthew 5, 13, but I, I'll promise I'll get back to it. So I make old fashioned lye soap. Um, it's science <laughs> mixing some, some chemicals with water. Anyways. I, so this is why I want to pause and, and talk about this because I remember when I first started making soap, it was the same time I started studying my Bible. And so at this time I was like reading about lye and, the science behind making soap and the ancient practice of making soap. And then I found the word lie in the Bible. It's in, it was in Job. And I'm like, Oh, God's talking to me. <laughs> I remember like feeling so overwhelmed with joy because I randomly started making soap at a really a bad time in my life and found that in the Bible. And I just always thought it was so cool. But now that I know and understand salt and sodium, um, this these verses just really hit me so salt so, okay so old how you make old sap, old fashioned soap is you you use lye right and you mix it with fat and it makes soap it goes through the soponification process which makes your soap it's what you use to make lye is sodium hydroxide right it's made from wood ash mixed with water and when lye is mixed with the fat that's when it becomes the soap so it's ash, right? That's what lie is. It's ash. It's, it's salt. Malachi 3, 2. And I promise I'll explain this because this is, this is huge for understanding the treading and trampling underfoot. But who may abide the day of his coming? 
And who shall stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. I never understood that verse. You can kind of get, you can get the idea of it, but there's, there's way more depth to it. So refiner is the Hebrew word serap. It means founder, goldsmith. It means to melt, pure, purge away, purge by fire, purify, try to smelt, refine, and test. Fuller's is the Hebrew word kabas. It means to wash by treading, be washed, perform the work of a fuller, to wash properly by stamping with the feet, <laughs> tread or uh, trample with feet. Wash garments by treading. So here, here I am with trying to connect all these verses to the harvest and like it's always coming to the grapes, but I didn't realize that that's how they would wash clothes um, before is by trampling them underfoot. So the word soap here is the Hebrew word boret, which I'm pretty sure is where you get the word borax. Um, but it means lye. It means ashes. It means salt. <laughs> used in washing or cleansing property. Okay. So back to Matthew 5, 13, this isn't only referencing the grapes being crushed, but it's actually talking about the church who are dressed in fine linen as they have already washed their robes. They've already been tread down, right? That's going to happen through the first half of the tribulation period. It's also going to ha happen in the second half of the tribulation period um, where the people that came out of the great tribulation are in white robes right linen um which is flax again i'm going to do a bible study on the flax and the and the wick and and the linen but they're not being trampled underfoot as grapes their 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 robes are being washed <laughs> so anyways i i just really thought that was a cool connection to know that there's multiple tramplings <laughs> luke 10 19 it says behold I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing will injure you. Again, that's a covenant. See, I think Matthew 513 is a warning to not lose your reward of the mid-trib rapture and thrown out and trampled underfoot. We can now see changing the rem changing to the remnant or the gleanings being trampled underfoot. Luke 21, 24, and they will fall by the edge of the sword and will be led captive into all the nations, and Jerusalem will be trampled, same words here, underfoot by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. There, it's a washing the robe. It's not the crushing of the grapes. And I, I know I could be off there too with the grape, the whole grape thing, but um, yesterday I got up and I'm like, God, something's not connecting for me with this. And he just, he just gave it to me. And it was all through the soap. It's it's just really cool because he's he the way he's used soap in my life. I've I've sown a lot of seeds through soap, um, and I've seen a lot of fruit growing from my soap ministry. Anyways, it's it's just it was really cool yesterday morning. I the last few days I haven't done anything. <laughs> we have an event coming up this weekend that I am completely not prepared for. Because this was too good. It's consumed every second. And I loved it. Okay, sorry. I keep demeaning. Leviticus 23, 22. And when ye reap the harvest of your land, thou shalt not make clean riddance of the corners of thy field when thou reapest. Neither shalt thou gather any gleanings of thy harvest. Thou shalt leave them unto the poor and to the stranger. I am the Lord your God. Okay. This is the gleanings. This is the main harvest, and then there's a little left behind, right? So how the harvest model works is you get the first fruits. I actually think I have that down. I'm not going to jump ahead. Yeah, sorry. Revelation 11.2. Leave out the court, which is outside the temple, and do not measure it. Remember, that was also the reed being told, do not measure it. For it has been given to the nations, and they will tread underfoot the holy city for 42 months. Revelation 14, 20. And the wine press was trodden outside the city, and blood came out from the wine press up to the horses' bridles for a distance of 200 miles. Revelation 19, 15. 
From his mouth comes a sharp sword, so that with it he may strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. And he treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God, the Almighty. Okay, so that's where I was having the hold up. It's like, he's treading underfoot, but it's the wine press, right? It, there's multiple treadings. I was trying to understand, because in my opinion, it was like the, the gleanings or the remnant were thrown into the fire, right? As the wicked, and it's his fierce wrath, but they're preserved from that. So if anyone else had a problem connecting those verses, I hope that helped, because it helped me. If I explained it right, hopefully it helped you. Anyways, so this to me is, um, this is when the church is treading the evil grapes. I think they're the ones, they're treading, right? He's ruling them with a rod of iron, and he treads the wine press. That's the church at work. So the church treads and washes their garments. The gleanings are crushed to remove the chaff, and the grapes, or the wicked ones, will be thrown into the great wine press of the wrath of God. And again, I won't go there yet. Okay, so I'm seeing this as if the church loses its flavor, it will be thrown out as the, pres as the preserving remnant that will be trampled underfoot throughout the time of Jacob's trouble. If the remnant doesn't make it into the barn, are they like the grape that's crushed for wine? Anyways, that's my question because I still have a lot of setting to do on that. Job 6.6. 6. Can something tasteless be eaten without salt? Or is there any taste in the white of an egg? Job 6, 7. The things that my soul refused to touch are as my sorrowful meat. Okay, that word sorrowful meat is diseased meat. What could it have been prevented with? Salt. When meat is butchered, it will soon begin to decay or rot because of the surface bacteria. Salt kills bacteria and prevents uh, rapid putrefaction, right? So again, I've used this a few times because it's so important. Psalm 37, 28, for the Lord loves justice and does not forsake his godly ones. They are preserved forever. It's an everlasting covenant. But the descendants of the wicked will be cut off. Okay, salt hydrates the cells. This is what I've learned. <laughs> I've been doing a lot of studying on salt outside of the Bible, but just the actual substance of salt and its um, attributes. So salt hydrates the cells and dries out the dead ones through the process of detoxing. It reminds me how he cuts off the branches that aren't producing fruit. They're cast, right? Sorry. Um, there's that verse that says, cast the evil ones from among you. Dead cells producing death are cast out, right? Just like our body with salt literally drives out the dead cells that aren't helping our body at all. Just fascinating. Mark 9, 43, and if thy hand offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter into life maimed than having two hands to go into hell, into the fire that shall never be quenched. This is, this is to the church and to the gleanings. Mark 9, 44, where there, worm, where, there, where there worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. Mark 9, 45, and if thy foot offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter half into life than having two feet to be cast into hell, into the fire that shall never be quenched. Mark 9, 46, where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. And if thine eye offend thee, pluck it out. It is better for thee to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire, where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. For everyone shall be salted with fire, and every sacrifice shall be salted with salt. Again, it's better that we're salted with the whole, the, the fire from the Holy Spirit inside of us than to be cast out into hellfire. So that is, that's where I think I should stop there. I had a whole lot, but I, I think that that is a good conclusion. Kristen, this was amazing. You've taken us from table salt. <laughs> and you know how the how the body needs table salt how it's crucial for life you've taken us all the way through the the old testament the new testament and you've connected with our spirit our spirit needs that salt and 
I'm thinking, you know, the only thing that is eternal is the word of God. Mm -hmm. That is the only thing that's eternal. Yeah. You know, we can do all of these good works and all of these services and we can, um, you know, help with these nonprofit organizations and even just do simple, kind deeds when we're out and about with complete strangers or with neighbors. But, you know, still all that, all those services, they're going to burn up unless we have gotten the word of God into them and they have retained it as good soil retains it. And so you've taken us through this journey and I'm you know, reflecting back and realizing I need to be more in prayer for the soil. Mm. Because if the yeah. soil does not uh, get the salted word of God from me and is not, I'm not providing the salt with that word as I'm doing the service or the kind deed, then right. it's going, to, it's not eternal. It's that person is going to be burned up. So this right. was such an important lesson and full of so many points, but they needed to be made. They needed to be included in the study. So I'm so grateful. I was just wondering, so this is a question I have. Uh, Matthew seven twenty six. could the sand equal salt. Mm. And also um, in Genesis twenty two seventeen, where it talks to Abraham that he was told that he would be as the sand of the sea, which is on the seashore, which is salt. <laughs> Honestly, <laughs> yeah. This, this, everything connects to something. <laughs> I had to leave a lot out to, to make it fit in, the, in our time. Everything is connected to salt and salt being pulverized and powder and ash and, and dust and, and all of these things. It's, it's very much all connected. And, and again, there's a good connotation and the bad connotation for both aspects. Um, I think like the throwing the ash on the head is a sign of repentance. That's, that's salt in my opinion. I mean, so yeah, I know we had talked about um, about Ruth and, and the, the salt attributes that are in that, but I think I'm going to use those verses for the, the threshing floor um, study. But there's a lot in there too. And, and yeah, salt, sand is salty, right? The salt, or is that just salt coming from the water? I don't know. But that's a, that's a good question. This salt connects. This has been the hardest and most rewarding Bible study I think I've done uh, for myself and what I got out of it um, because it's just, it's just like eye openingly connecting everything from the Old to the New Testament. And, and in regards to the, the salt being a part of our bodies, I, I know that a lot of people say that when people get lost at sea that they shouldn't drink the salt of the of the ocean right mm -hmm. um, i read an article where there was a guy that was he was at sea for like 30 days right and he was drinking the salt water and that was the only way that he survived and he was totally healthy when he came back until they gave him <laughs> water from from out of the tap right I that. wow because we know we've been lied to you about everything so that makes perfect sense why yeah. have we not to drink the sea water wow interesting interesting i know that um so i've been drinking um redmond's ancient sea salt every day and i finally got rid of my joint pain Finally, from this way of eating, because you're not eating the carbohydrates that um, that hydrate you, you really have to supplement because our water, our water now that we moved, we were, we did have well water, um, but now we're in this um, a, a smaller city and it's 
smells like chlorine and it's really bad. So we had to get a, a water filter and everything. Like they're they're over they're just putting chemicals and everything and it's killing out all the minerals that they used to have in the ancient times to be healthy and we don't have that anymore. So now we have to supplement it. But I feel like a new person with the sea salt um water every every day. Thank you for this study. It was beautiful. Yeah, it was a lovely study. Uh, it'll be, I'm sure I'll be thinking of it often as I'm reading and see all those references to salt. I'm going to need to reread a lot of things. Oh, that's how I felt. I was like, oh, man, <laughs> I have missed so much. And, you know, I'm like, I, got, I just got to reread with new eyes again just from all the connections. But it's it's pretty cool how he's just continuously giving us these amazing insights to his word. Um, and just one word can open up a huge study. So I'm super excited. I took a bunch of notes just because the grapes that you spoke on and the salt covenants that you spoke on and it being like we can be seasoned as well. Like there's so many things that I my mind's just going to go for the next hours. I don't know how you put all that compacted into one little area. I don't know how you did it, but it was such a blessing to listen to, and you did amazing. Um, so thank, thank you for that. Thank you, Nikki. I haven't stopped thinking about salt. I'm not telling you. It's the study I had. I have every time I go to, went to shore, and I, I added more pages. I, this whole twenty two pages, and I think I got us to page sixteen. <laughs> so there's a lot to it. But a lot needs to be studied in order to understand the next parts, you know. So I was I kind of cut it so that we could study something else. And this would this would just make so much more sense too. Yeah. Well, that's I, all. I love how it was connected with the harvest model. You know, the the bride is the first fruits, the church is the main harvest, and the remnant are the gleanings at the end. And so it's interesting because the remnant will be sprinkled with salt of fire, but that's going to preserve them so they can take it right. on into the millennial reign. Thank you, Sue, for, for letting me take over for today. Okay. I hope you were as richly blessed by her study as all of us were on this prophecy team. And as you can understand, she was very thorough in her presentation. But like she said, there is a lot more to that subject and there's a lot of bunny trails. So we're hoping that this gets you onto your own good start of this topic and that you will want to study it out further on your own. So thank you so much for watching all the way to the end. And I'll talk to you later. Bye.